Welcome. Nice to see you here. Um, I'm Rasmus, work at Unity with my colleague Dario. Uh, we will take the practical part afterwards. And we're here to talk about dependency management. Um, and now I had a chat with a few of you. It seems like dependency management is something that we are all facing. Um, probably it's a, a problem we sort of created ourselves in this industry, um, <laughs> but that's a different topic. I say for myself, I uh, started programming actually even on a ZX81, the uh, same one as was shown in the keynote this morning. But I say when I started the sort of proper programming was in the 90s, where um, I say Ball and Pascal was my first real compiler used. And I remem remember back then that you had the compiler version and then you would have all the libraries bundled with that. It was a, a simpler world. It has changed a bit um, since then. And that's what we are here to talk about. Just quick, uh, we come from Unity uh, that builds a game engine. Uh, looks like this, uh, editor. Um, but as you can see, there's a development environment for building uh, 3D modeling, uh, 3D visualizations, and it's also used for architecture visualizations and even uh, simulations, uh, physics simulations. Um, we work in a team where we are focusing on developer productivity, developer experience uh, among the, I don't know the exact number, a uh, couple of thousand developers at Unity. So that's sort of the uh, developer audience we have at Unity with the things we're working on. Um, so when we talk about, we actually like to call this uh, dependency management at scale, uh, and we talk about scale. Uh, the Unity product itself runs on uh, Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux. Um, and then we are able to build runtimes, sort of games, uh, runtimes that runs on more than 20 different uh, platforms from iOS, Android, uh, to uh, PlayStation, Xbox consoles. So that probably gives you an idea about um, the scale of uh, some of the engineering challenges we're facing. And when we talk about dependency management, I can recommend this book, uh, that's at least they're not there in the audience. Um, I think it's a very good book on general, on uh, software engineering um, from at Google. They also even have a, a chapter dedicated to dependency management, uh, which tells that there's actually, um, there's some attention to this area. Uh, what that uh, chapter um, talks about is uh, for things like uh, how do we update dependencies, how do we describe versions of dependencies, um, and even uh, how do we uh, decide when it's safe to depend or to, uh, depend on code produced by other organizations. And say in our uh, experience, our learning is that when your organization becomes large enough, then other organizations can be somewhere within your own organization and can even be something that was produced by your own team, but is still considered a dependency on what you're working on. So a uh, quick reminder on why we want to keep dependencies updated. Um, back in 2017, you might have heard about this, a uh, data breach from Equifax uh, leaked uh, more than 150 million uh, records containing personal information and credit cards uh, of uh, American and British citizens. Um, yes, uh, that uh, gave them the fame of a Wikipedia page. I assume that's not how we want to have a Wikipedia page. Um, but uh, financially, that was a uh, fine of uh, 600 mil 650 million US dollars for that uh, data leak. And from a uh, technical perspective, it was a a uh, vulnerability that had been uh, a, pa a patch available in uh, March that year, and they were attacked in May. So that gives, a, in this case, a two-month window for them to address uh, a patch uh, their systems. Two months can be a short time, long time, depending on how you look at it. Sometimes two months pass by very quickly. Um, and then when we get to the uh, point of um, actually needing to apply that critical se security patch, we don't want our house to look like this. Um, we don't want to be in a state where we first need to update 10 other things before we can actually apply that critical security patch. Um, so dependency management is also closely related to keeping our technical depth in control. Um, and then you might be thinking, okay, but then we just always just reference the latest um, of any given library, um, but this is where we would like to share our uh, a story from ourselves and why what actually started this. So uh, 
almost exactly a year ago, on the 5th of November 2021, we came to work and our build notif notification channel looked like this. Um, our CI system looked like this, uh, red almost everywhere we looked. Uh, and then the normal uh, process we have for this is to identify what was a pull request that introduced some uh, issue in the in CI and revert that so we can, without stress, uh, fix it and reapply it. But we looked at the recent uh, pull request that had landed and nothing stood out as being able to cause this at least. So what we see here is the after the fact um, view on um, on the uh, release history for the uh, tool called pipenv. So that uh, showed that on the 5th of November, they released a version which was picked, out, picked up by our CI tooling, uh, built into an image uh, and used for running our CI. Uh, that version was later reverted. Um, and it, uh, even though we actually had some sort of tooling around managing dependencies, making sure to update dependencies, that also made us realize that we are we have we, there's something missing in our setup, uh, so that started our journey, um, and it was such a defining moment for us that uh, my colleague Dario he uh, actually wrote a uh, <laughs> spontaneously wrote this poem, and it, it is on our Slack channel. Let me uh, read it out loud for you. Remember, remember the fifth of November, Pippin new releases and dots. I know no reason why the unpinned dependency treason should ever be forgot. So. So that is uh, how we remember uh, where we started this journey. Uh, and I've also talked to a few other people, and it sounds like uh, most of us actually have an experience of the one version of some tool which broke everything, um, and that's where we learned the hard way about dependencies. Um, so when we talk about dependencies, uh, in this case we mean code and tools um, used in a product, but external to the product itself. Um, and the imp important part here is the, the tools, that it can be more than just NPM packages or libraries. It's actually also the, the tools that is part of, um, of our CI. And as you probably also uh, can hear, it's, it's very closely to re related to, um, to the CI, to dependency management in our CI processes. Um, and an important aspect of that is deterministic CI, actually making sure that we are able to produce reliable, the same results, um, even at, at a later point from a given revision. So um, let's look at the CI. We start a simple, small project. We have just one job. Builds, tests, perhaps deploys, but quickly it turns out to be impractical. We need perhaps to run, uh, build on one platform or one architecture, a test on another. Um, but that introduces this uh, link between uh, the CI jobs. And even now, in our case, it scales out on running tests across uh, different uh, platforms. Could be uh, running UI tests, browser tests against different browsers. Um, but then still relying on actually that the, the, the build we get um, is deterministic. And um, that requires us to talk about how to actually version uh, dependencies. You're probably all familiar with this uh, semantic versioning, talk about major, minor patch, uh, widely used in open source, um, but also for, uh, we use it internally for versioning our um, own tools. Uh, you also see it used in uh, the Docker images, typically uh, also some sort of version number where the major number denotes a breaking change, uh, minor no denotes a, uh, can be a new feature, but still keeping the API backwards compatible, and the patch is a bug fix without any changes to the, um, to the API. So, uh, so that sounds good. We just uh, allow uh, minor and the patch version updates uh, because that should be stable. Um, I say early on we, we had to ask ourselves the question whether um, yes, that's the, uh, in package.json, uh, you use the caret to say that keep the major version, let the other um, is upgrade. But we had to ask ourselves this question, is semantic versioning a promise uh, on estimates? Um, you probably already have uh, guessed the answer, but to give an example, um, actually the, the uh, Simver NuGet package itself um, introduced a 
uh, minor update from 2.1 to 2.2. Uh, should be fine to land that, except that it actually also required a, a code change. Not a big code change, um, but still a code change that means that if we had just landed this, something would have broken. Um, which makes us conclude that we should probably see sem semantic versioning as more as a risk estimate uh, these days. Um, and probably also a more pragmat pragmatic approach to versioning. Um, otherwise, all packages would probably be on version 42 and above. Uh, if every time we make a, a change like that, we have to actually bump um, the, the version number. So when we talk about dependency pinning in this context, that means uh, referencing dependencies using explicit, ver explicit version number, uh, not ranges, uh, but exact version numbers. So back to um, the from before. Um, look at CI. So we have a CI job, take some input variables, uh, job, def job definition, to move here so I'm not in the way. Uh, job definition, that was not this one, job definition, the so state of the source code at the time, environment variables or other configuration that you can pass into the CI, um, and dependencies. The job definition is, for instance, the, the YAML used in GitHub Actions for defining that job. Um, and dependencies, as we've seen, can be the, the tools that are also used as part of this uh, run that CI. And the output of that is some artifacts and a, a result um, success failure. So we have input to our CI job, which defines then the output, and we want that to be t deterministic all the times. So we have seen the dependencies um, can give us some challenges. So our the sort of the exercise here is for us to um, how can we actually represent the dependencies uh, in in source code and make that deterministic then, and that is where my colleague Dario will show some practical ways of applying that. Are we good on time. Thank you, Rasmus. Hello, everyone. Is it working? Yes. So my name is Dario, and I work with Rasmus at Unity, and I wrote, I write uh, code and poems. So um, dependency pinning. One of the messages that uh, my colleague Rasmus is uh, trying to send is that when talking about CI, and specifically at scale, it usually pays off to use specific versions of the things that you depend on on your CI. So I want to play a game. I am going to be showing fragments of CI-related code, and I want us to find the unpinned dependencies. Here I have a first example of a GitHub workflow. And I'm sure that everyone has noticed that we are installing PPM as part of this job, and that this will install the latest version of PPM that is available at the moment this job runs. So that is an unpin dependency. But some of you might have also noticed that this job is also dependent on a checkout GitHub action, specifically version 3. Now I call this a seemingly pin dependency. It looks like it's pin, but if you go to the repository where this checkout action is hosted, you will realize that v3 is actually pointing, pointing to the latest version in the version 3 range. So this is also an unpin dependency. Here we have another GitHub workflow fragment. And again, we see the seemingly pin dependencies. Now, one of these GitHub actions has a configuration field called .NET version, and this is using 6.0.x. So as everyone has guessed, this is also an appeal dependency. And if you wonder is if the patch mm, part of a release can actually break your build, well, we know it can, because it happened to us from patch number 301 to patch number 302. So this is also an unpin dependency. But we have other types of unpin dependencies in this example. For example, this one. Here we are checking out the repository 
probably we have some tools that we are going to be using as part of this uh, CI job. And again, we are checking out the latest revision of this Unity Tools repository on the default branch. So this is, again, an independency. <laughs> and last, I would like to highlight that this job is going to be running on some machine. It could be a machine, a physical one, a virtual machine, or it could be a Docker container. But wherever it runs, there will be some software pre-installed. And you might be depending on software on that machine. For example, you might be using JQ to process some JSON during your job. And this can also introduce unpin dependencies. We have here another example, slightly different one. This is from our own virtual image uh, file format. But there is a there's a hundred percent parallelism to what would happen if you would use uh, Docker images for your CI. Now we happen to run a lot of stuff in uh, virtual machines. But what we see here is again we have something similar to what we saw with the PPM. We are installing some tool, and this tool is some pin. But the, the important one that I wanted to highlight in this slide is that sometimes we also reference base images. And this happens in Docker world every time. And we reference them with latest reference. And this is, of course, an unpin dependency. Everyone, everyone knows that. So what I would like you to take home from this game is that unpin dependencies manifest in many different ways. So what do we do? Well, we pin them, right? So we start using specific versions when we install stuff. We use full versions on our GitHub Actions. More of the same. We avoid version ranges. Always check out the specific revisions when we check out repositories. Or we choose to run our CI always in containers that we control. And of course, we avoid references to latest. And yeah, I know that that version doesn't necessarily need to be pinned, strictly speaking, because that could be a mutable reference, but let's not complicate the problem further. So, <laughs> as everything in engineering, there are trade-offs. Even if we wanted to do what I just showed, what we've realized is that the more you pin, the more you have to keep up to date. And this keeping up to date can be actually pretty costly. Now, our learning is that if you're working at a large project with large number of commits per day, large number, number of dependencies, large number of contributors, then you normally want to pay that price. So we are going to give you some practical advice that we hope it helps to start this journey of pinning if you aren't there yet. The first one is regarding what to pin. And we believe that the question that you should be asking yourselves are, how often does this dependency change? How likely is that a new release will break my build? Or how difficult it will be to determine that a specific breakage was caused by that specific dependency? Will everyone be able to sort that out? In our experience, when we started this journey of dependency pinning, we found out that a good way to start was to look at our CI infrastructure. That means our internal tooling, our images, but once we started with this, we realized that there was no reason why we wouldn't want to apply the same principle to third-party dependencies. So we concluded that we should try to pin wherever we believe is cheap to keep up to date. Now, cost is not something fixed. You can actually make something to 
reduce the cost of keeping things up to date. You have to invest on the problem of dependency pinning. For us, this means two things. The first one is to rely on tests. And I know it's 2022, post-COVID, everyone has a perfect suite of tests. But the thing is that what you want to avoid is to start guessing whether this new release is going to break my build based so solely on if it has changed major, minor, or patch. You just want to see it green and merge if it's green. But you also want to have tooling, tooling that allow you to automatically update all those dependencies across the repositories of your organization. Because you don't want to do this manually. I've done that in a previous work experience, and it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So this is the one thing that we want to talk about now in this last part of the presentation, tooling. You could go and build your own tools. You have time and resources. But at Unity, we've been using an open source tool called Renovate that we found very useful to address this problem of uh, dependency pinning. Renovate is a command line application, and uh, it is written in TypeScript. We are aware that uh, there exists other tooling that does similar things. We are happy with Renovate because it's written on a language that we understand, and we have had very good uh, collaboration with the developers who we've submitted uh, bugs or ask for features. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, general about the uh, Renovate and also how we use it specifically at Unity. So the principle is very simple. You have this command line application, and you give it some information about your repositories, and then it will go and scan all the files in the repository, looking for all possible dependencies. And this is called extracting dependencies, and it will extract the dependency name and the dependency version. Then, with this information, it goes to different software repositories and attempts to find new versions of those dependencies. So for example, you could have a POM XML file if you're working with Java, or you could have a package.json file, or you could have a ppm log file. So all of those files contain some dependencies and some version information, and then Renovate will extract that information and go to the relevant software repositories, Maven Central, mm, NPM Registry, uh, PyPy Index, etc. And then with that information, it can create pull requests. So it was pretty simple to understand. The component in Renovate that does this uh, file scanning is called a manager. And the component that goes to the repositories, to the, to the software repositories, and, and, and tries to find new versions is called uh, data source. So these are the two concepts that you need to understand if you want to start using Renovate. And if you wonder how a uh, pull request looks like, it's something like this. And this is also a good example because when I think about package managers, which I associate with this idea of manager, I normally think about POM XML, I think about uh, package JSON, but I normally don't think straight away about, for example, a GitHub workflow. Renovate has functionality to find out dependencies on those other files that you would normally not call a package manager file format. So this is actually updating one of those seemingly pinned dependencies from version 2 to version 3. Now, there is one particular Renovate manager that is particularly interesting, and it is called a regex manager. This is very interesting because it adds a lot of flexibility to Renovate. Whenever you find yourself in a situation where you have your own file format, how do you extract dependencies? Probably if you contact Renovate, they are not going to be interested in implementing that functionality for you. But you can use this regex manager. So let's recall this example of our own virtual image uh, file format. And we had a command saying something like choco install unity tool. And now I've pinned it to version 1.0.0. 0. 0. 
And this could be appearing, for example, in files that we prefix with the image dash prefix and a YAML extension. Now somewhere in your infrastructure, you have versions of that uh, particular Unity tool. And uh, Choco is a um, command from a package manager called uh, Chocolaty. And it actually uses uh, nuggets under the hood. So this repository that we host with our tooling is actually a nugget repository type. So we can go and instruct Renovate to update these versions that we find in these commands. And we do that by configuring some JSON file, whether in a repository or a shared Renovate configuration. And we add something like this. Now here you see that there is a file match, which is what is telling Renovate which files it should scan. Then you see that we have something called data source template. And this is telling Renovate that when you find these dependencies, you should check for new versions in a Nugget repository. And then you see also something called match strings. This is a, collections, a collection of uh, regex expressions, which is how you instruct Renovate to extract that dependency information, the dependency name and the dependency version. And with that, it can operate on this new file format that, that you own. The regex managers are actually more powerful than you would expect if you just think regex. So even if you are thinking that, yeah, but this won't work in every case, it's true, but they provide some intelligent functionality, uh, recursive strategy, etc. So I suggest you check out the docs. They are very good. Now if you happen to be interested in this tool, I think you might want to know that you have multiple ways of running it. You can run it, uh, like it's an NPM package, so you can run it as any other NPM application. There is a GitHub app, and then you have also other options, uh, Docker image, GitHub uh, action, and a GitLab runner, and other. At Unity, we do a little bit different. And it is because we came to the point where we needed more from Renovate. So what we have is we keep a fork of Renovate in our own repository, and we keep it as a subtree, which we try to keep up to date as frequent as possible. And then we modify it a little bit, uh, just enough to allow us to inject the functionality that we want, uh, but trying not to modify it too much so as to make it painful when Renovate upstream changes. So some of the functionality we've added, for example, is uh, managers and data sources for handling our specific uh, use cases. We have, for example, releases of uh, our Unity editor that are distributed internally, and we want to be able to pin those in the different uh, repositories and we want to be able to update them as well. Our own internal releases of uh, packages and so on. And of course, our virtual images that I saw that file format before. But we've also added some uh, capabilities for uh, uh, metrics. So we can, uh, we can push metrics to some place where we can then create uh, dashboards. And, uh, and then we can somehow track both the adoption of Renovate across the organization, but also address uh, problems such as repositories that haven't updated dependencies for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. So we can have a bit of an overview. And that th this is one of the reasons we, we modified Renovate. Uh, uh, right now, you don't have uh, a good way to extend Renovate. You don't have a possibility to create your own uh, data sources, and you don't have the possibility to create your own managers apart from those regex managers that we talked about. Uh, apart from that, we also um, release our own versions of Renovate internally, which we package in Docker images. And then people can use them from their uh, GitHub uh, workflows, something like this. And we also provide um, a reusable uh, GitHub workflow. And you might have noticed in both cases that they are versioned 
Um, and the good thing about this is that uh, because we are using Renovate, Renovate becomes also a dependency of our CI, and we rely on that to keep everything uh, up to date. So we want to make sure that new versions of Renovate that we release don't break the uses of Renovate in the repositories that use them. And with this versioning and this way of uh, packaging and publishing, we are able to use Renovate to update Renovate uh, within the repositories. And this is something that we like. So uh, where we are at today, we believe that um, our CI stability has improved considerably since we started pinning. We also see more and more people in our organization adopting these uh, ideas, but we still have to invest a lot in strategies to be able to apply this at uh, an organizational level, to be able to handle um, noise of PRs created by Renovate. We need more automation, etc. But uh, we think we are on a better place than when we started. And I'm happy to share that we actually managed to pin and keep the PPM version that uh, led to this presentation today. And this is all we had for you today. When you go home today, I hope you can think about dependencies and that you remember not only the 5th, but also the 8th of November. Thank you very much for your being here, and we look forward to hearing your ideas on this topic. Yes.